Good evening. I'm Sundas Martinez. Welcome to another edition of Native Voice TV. And I'm Siwa Pili Rose Amador, and together we are Native Voice TV. We are the Indigenous people. Yeah, we have a different show tonight. We're going to mix it up a little bit. Yeah, <laughs> we're going to have a two-parter for you. Yeah. Um, and it's my pleasure to introduce Al Cross, Thank Renita you. Brian, yes. and Pat Brian. Mm -hmm. Welcome all of you. Before we get started, I'd like Renita to tell us about something exciting coming up in the community. What is it? Yes, it's <laughs> called, uh, we're doing the Native American, Native American Heritage Celebration. It's going to be November 2nd of this year. It's a Thursday evening. Mm -hmm. It's going to be a celebration at the San Jose City, the new San Jose City Hall Rotunda and Plaza. This will be the first time we've done something very of this first caliber time. at City Hall. Right? Yes, definitely. It's a, hall, it's a good way to break it in. I think so. Yeah, yeah, yeah right, the new hall, definitely. And break it in, good. Right. <laughs> the way it should be. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and we plan to have um, events from uh, 1 p.m. to 9 p.m. For instance, 1, through, 1 p.m. through 5 p.m., we're going to have ed educational booths. That's mm -hmm. where we're going to have our various Native American organizations come out and set up mm -hmm. to educate the public. We're going to have uh, educational workshops. That would be for, uh, we're going to invite some of the elementary schools to come out oh, and participate nice. in some arts and crafts and bookmarks. We're going to have a bone marrow registration. Uh, oh, child ident identification registration, and we're going to have Native Voice, oh. you know, <laughs> bring their videos to share, you know, what's been uh, taped earlier or previously right. about We've had various a few community yes, members on yes, so definitely. Yeah. So we're going to have prizes and you know raffle drawings, and then in the evening, from uh, 6 p.m. to 9 p.m. We're going to have our drummers come. They're going to drum and sing. We're going to have a fashion show, a regalia fashion show, and uh, we're going to mm -hmm. honor our, our elders in the community. That's so great. come out and join us. Right. And we are seeking donations, so that would be great to, uh, you know, w we need to put on this program, have a successful yeah. event. And it takes, you know, a little bit of money to do that. Takes some money, yeah. So all those businesses, be generous. Yes. And Who should they contact? Yeah, they can definitely. contact us at Native Voice yeah. TV. Great, great. Working and do they want $100 bills or just 20s or, or just change? You that? take $100 bills. $100 bills. Yeah, <laughs> at least <laughs> a few of those. <laughs> but thank you, Renita, and I hope everybody comes out for that yeah, great event. Be definitely. Beautiful event. But we have a two-part show coming up, and uh, at this time I'd like to turn it over to El Cross, who's going to moderate. We're going to talk about relocation and I know everyone's kind of heard about it a little bit but what really is relocation so the pros and cons about yeah, it everything. and everything yeah so starting from the beginning we're going to so. take a break so we'll see you guys next week <laughs> next <laughs> <laughs> take it away Al well uh, relocation is, is a program that American Indians underwent starting probably in the 1950s mid 1950s and it carried through up until probably the into the 70s through the through the latter part of the 50s and the 19 and the decade of the 60s. Um, San Jose, of course, was one of the relocation sites here. San Jose, California, was picked as a relocation site. And in California, we had four relocation sites: we had Los Angeles, San Jose, San Francisco, and Oakland. As a result, we have a, we had a lot of American Indian people coming to California during that period. I'm planning to do a relocation reunion sometime in the, in the near future and trying to get a hold of all the people that had come on relocation, get them together again and try to do something, just get some stories that they've had in that, in that process. A little history on the relocation was that it came about in the 50s, 1950s. There were two major programs or Indian policies that took place in the government then. One was termination and the other one was Indian relocation programs. Um, both thought, both of them with sort of the goal to get out of the Indian business for the, for the government, to get rid of the Indian business, you know, stop, stop working with the Indian. So the termination came first and then followed right close on its heels was 
was relocation. Okay, now termination was... Yeah, was to terminate Indian tribes from their relationship get, to the federal government. Get them out of their, their sovereign nations and yeah, try to... Just to so terminate get, them as an Indian, to yeah. actually terminate them as American Indians, and then they had, they had no to more relationship. Them yeah, and, to, yeah. So they wouldn't okay. have to work with them anymore. Mm -hmm. yeah. it, you guys don't remember the 1950s, but the 1950s was a fairly regressive period. If you can think back in the 1950s, we had McCarthyism, you know, we got a lot of big republicanism coming in, Dwight D. Eisenhower, I like Ike became president, mm -hmm. and, and followed, there was a whole bunch of regressive programs that took place in the political scene. So out of that, in the Indian department or in the interior department, we've got relocation and termination, which followed that regressive mm -hmm. stance. Uh, so anyway, what I'm going to do, in 1950, they opened a relocation office here in San Jose, probably right at the latter part of the 50s, right around 57 or 58, and started to use this as a site to bring people, bring, Ameri bring Indians in for relocating to, pro to the city. So I'm trying to get them back together. We're, we're much like the World War II veterans now that we're still trying to get because they're starting to to leave us, and they're starting to mainly are going away. So I want to catch as many of them before that happens. We can get here, we can have relocation, because now we've got not only the original relocatees, we've got two generations beyond them. We've got a first, second generation, and third generation of, of Indians that have come out of that relocation program. So my hope is to have a, re, um, have a reunion and then talk to all three of them, and eventually try to work it into sort of a documentary. That would be excellent. Because it's a very important part of American Indian history mm -hmm. that, that I don't think a lot of people know. Yeah. It took Indians not only to California, it took Indians all over the country to various mm -hmm. urban settings, what they called it. They called it urban industrial settings where they tried to place Indians. Um, so tonight I'm, I've got two people with me, Renita and I've got Pat, who are both relocatees. These are first... Um, original relocatees, and they have both have wonderful stories to tell about their relocation experiences. I came on relocation myself to San Jose, California in 1960, so I've been here now since 1960, 46 years in San Jose. Two-thirds of my life has been here, so I've been two-thirds of my life off reservation now. And I'm pretty much, uh, I think, now uh, an off-reservation in and I think this is probably where I'll finish my life here in the mm -hmm. city because I've become very part of this community here in Santa Clara County. So tonight um, I'm going to talk to Pat and talk to Renita. They both have wonderful stories how they got here, how their lives have proceeded over these last 20 or 30 years and what they've done. And they now have a son, a, you know, that's growing, that's growing, an, an adult son that's also now one of the second generation or an urban-born kid, kid mm -hmm. that an American Indian that's born in the city, who has a whole different experience, you know, of what it is to be an Indian now, as yeah. opposed to where we came from. So, without further ado, I want to talk, and I think I'll ask Renita to start first. Renita Bryan, Renita Pinkman Bryan. <laughs> Renita Pinkham Bryan. And, and Pinkham mm -hmm. Bryan, and she is Ness Pierce. She's from Idaho, mm -hmm. so she's got a wonderful story. So, Renita, I think you'll just. Go ahead, and I'd like to ask you if you have any questions because of some of the things that come up, we're talking references that mm -hmm. you don't understand, ask us and we'll see if we can clarify them or make an answer to them. We'll, we'll do Great. that. Yeah. Um, well, first of all, I'd like to let you know that I'm, uh, my blood quantum is 13 sixteenths Nesper, so I'm almost full blood. Mm -hmm. So that means both of my parents are, you know, almost, I have a splash of, you know, other tribes within me. But uh, we lived on a, a small farm or ranch in Idaho on my uh, father's mother's land. And in the late 50s, I think I was about seven or eight years old, my mother and father decided to come out on the relocation program. So we were sent to uh, Southern California. And uh, my father and my mother, they both uh, received a job at Disneyland. And that was, you know, I loved it. Uh, my mother worked in the gift shop on Frontierland. My father was hired as one of the, he paddled the canoe around Frontierland. And in, in that time, they hired American Indians to paddle the tourists around, you know, Frontierland. 
And I thoroughly enjoyed it because sometimes Disneyland was our babysitter. And, uh, wow. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Mm. And then uh, my mother remarried a Choctaw Indian. So before that time, uh, my grandmother came and picked us up and we were taken back to Idaho to the reservation, which I thoroughly enjoyed. I have many good memories. My, my grandmother and my grandfather, they were both minister, the reverends of a Pentecostal church, which they built a church on their land on the reservation. So I have, I have very good memories. So my mother came back, she picked us up, she married a Choctaw man, and we came back out on relocation a second time to San Jose. And we lived Double in San Jose. Up. Yeah. <laughs> relocation, relocation. Right. <laughs> By that time, I was a little bit older, but uh, we lived in San Francisco, then we finally moved back to San Jose. But I remember, you know, the, the Indian Center in uh, San Francisco. Mm -hmm. We went to activities over there. We uh, went to the Indian Center in San Jose, went to the powwows as a little girl. Mm -hmm. So I, I really enjoyed myself, definitely. Mm -hmm. But eventually, uh, my mom moved back to the reservation in 19... 70, 71, because she wanted to be close to her mom who was, yeah. you know, about ready to be on dialysis. And at that time, you know, I had one year of college and I wasn't ready to go back. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I went to finish my education. There were jobs here. There were men to meet, you know, to, <laughs> to marry. Because if I went back, I knew most of, we were somehow all related in some mm -hmm. way. So, you know, I didn't think there was a future back there for me. Yeah. So what I eventually did is I landed a job at the Indian Center on San Fernando Street as a receptionist. Uh, before that time, I used to have a lot of Mexican girlfriends and hung around with them. But then when I started working for the Indian Center, I thought, okay, well, I want to be with my people, you know, hang around with them. And that's when I met my future husband, Pat at a powwow, and we eventually got married and had a son. But w what I would like to do I is eventually, when I do retire, is to go back, you know, home and build a house on my reservation, mm -hmm. which, you know, my father has land. And it's ironic to my father, when he first came out, he brought us out, he stayed out here until what? Until he was in the mid-50s, you know, and then he finally moved back to the reservation. So, and, and, and I think having that family unit helped, you know, be mm -hmm. me to be a, a success and a good parent, and uh, and just having that family unit, having us come out here, and I think that did a lot for me, definitely. Um, let me ask you a question mm -hmm. about. I know he's doing the moderation, but no. I want to ask a question. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, your parents obviously came here, and they mm -hmm. didn't like it, and they went back. Um, what were kind of the, 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 the dividing factors that, that caused them to go back? You know, like, was it financial hardship? Was it just missing home and family, or was it all the above? I was missing home and family. My mother, they even purchased a home here in San Jose, and oh, I remember okay. the BIA coming out, Bureau of Indian Affairs mm -hmm. coming out and taking pictures. You know, oh. success story. Oh, yeah. really? So they're doing good. <laughs> yeah, but uh, yeah, she was lonely. She wanted to go back, yeah. and uh, that's what she did. And uh, she's been back there ever since, and both of my parents are still alive. Now you, you talked about going to being in Disneyland, which yes. I mean, is pretty exciting for a kid. Was there a, a, an adjustment when you went back to the reservation? You said you enjoyed that too. I mean, it seems like yes. at a you know, young age. I really liked being around my relatives, you know, doing things, going places, but being in Disneyland, you know, was another great experience, <laughs> which, you know, I, you know, I, every day, or, or I remember hiding in the, the back seat of the car because my mom didn't have a babysitter and we'd be at Disneyland all, <laughs> all day. <laughs> wow. They might charge you. They might send you a bill. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I enjoyed both <coughs> places, but right now, you know, I think I'm getting lonely and I do want to go back. Yeah. So Pat's going to take you back, huh? Yes, he is. All right, Pat. Yes, he is. <laughs> <laughs> We've ha we have compromised. Yeah. <laughs> We're going to move to my reservation versus his reservation. <laughs> okay, Pat. So we'll uh, talk to Pat and get his story on, on relocation. Yeah, um, I more or less uh, came from a, fa a, big, a large family of 12 kids, you know. And, uh, my father died when I was around eight, nine years old. 
and my, our mother really couldn't afford to take care of us, so we relocated to boarding schools. I was raised in a boarding school since I was in sixth grade. You know. Then I went to boarding school in South Dakota, which was a, a long ways from where I'm from, you know. And, um, and I was, which, which was St. Joseph in Chamberlain, South Dakota. Then from there I went to Savannah, South Dakota. Then I, you know, graduated from high school there. Then um, I relocated back home, you know, from Savannah. Then uh, I spent a couple months there at, back home in Fort Peck. Then I went, I went to Haskell which is a Native American junior college back then. It was called the Haskell Institute. I went there two years and I, I served my, you know, my time and got my, my apprenticeship in um, Brickland, you know, so. And then from there, uh, I, I, I was roommates with a couple of, a couple of Choctaw, I mean, Chicka, I mean, Chip, um, uh, Cherokee Indians from Tillicoa. We were roommates and they were from Tillicoa and they asked me if I wanted to go to go work with them in Tulsa, Tulsa, Oklahoma, from Haskell, you know, to go find some brick work, you know. We looked around for about three months, but the Bureau of Indian Affairs took care of us. They put us in the YMCA, you know, until we found a job, until we got on our own feet. But it wasn't, it wasn't that easy finding a brick job because there's no hardly any work in brick lane. So what happened was I just, I just I couldn't find no work. So I went back to Wolf Point, where I'm from, Port Peck, you know, and I got a, I couldn't, I got a little job there, lasted about a year, and I couldn't, and they laid me off. Then I went to the Bureau of Indian Affairs again, in, in, in Poplar there, with the agency. Then they, uh, they asked me if I wanted to really relocate to California or any place. I said, yeah, I'll go to San Jose. So I, I enrolled for the welding school over on Coleman Avenue. They had a welding school there. I went there for six months. And you know, then I went to various other schools, like auto automotives, you know, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Then I ended up at Lockheed. <laughs> <laughs> so I've been there ever since, you know, 35, 32 years. And, you know. But when I, when I first came to California, uh, I was kind of lost, you know, because uh, it's a big city, you know. Mm -hmm. Then I told myself, I met a friend, and I said, where's the Indian Center at in San Jose? It's over on 2nd Street. So we walked down there. Then I seen this girl sitting behind the, the desk. I said, wow, look at that, man. That's the that's Indian girl, man. <laughs> 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 so I kind of got sparked up on her, you know. <laughs> See, I, rem I remember meeting he him yeah. at a powwow. He remembers meeting me at the at Indian the, Health oh, oh, well, Center. Yeah. He probably yeah. had his eye on you at the right. yeah. Indian yeah. Center. Right. He <laughs> made himself available at the powwow. Yeah. Yeah. He's stalking you. <laughs> yeah, yeah it, what's kind of interesting is that if you take that one step beyond, go back, say, another generation where parents met, a lot of parents met, were in boarding schools and a lot of marriages mm -hmm. came out of boarding schools. Mm -hmm. So you'll run into parents that are above us, one generation, and there'll be, this was first intertribal marriages between different tribes and they got married in boarding school. Now the relocation program also sort of form or started that again and, and sparked that again. So you now have marriages again, intertribal marriages from like Pat, Pat's mm -hmm. from Fort Peck, Montana, mm -hmm. and Renita's from Fort Hall, or not Fort Hall. <laughs> Idaho. <laughs> Idaho, rather. I got mixed up with another, another reservation up there, but she's an Idaho Indian. So mm -hmm. again, it had that effect of bringing tribes together. Um, we were talking earlier about what, what made people came, come on relocation, and mainly it was for employment. That was the main thing. Mm -hmm. The real Typical, the name, the, the proper name for the program that went through the government was called Employment Assistance Program. But it became, everybody commonly knew it as relocation. Yeah. And that right. became sort of the handle. They tried to kill relocation, but they couldn't. But that's well, the stuck. other one was just too hard yeah, to say. Yeah, and, and just say relocation. Right. Yeah. That's it. That's and it initially <laughs> they didn't do training. They just brought you out, mm -hmm. you found a job, and then they, you were relocated. So mm -hmm. that was it. And then later on, they started the training programs that Pat was talking about. That oh, they, so Pat got lucky. Started. Yeah, so he yeah, was coming yeah, a later bunch, yeah. so he was able to get into a training program. Mm -hmm. yeah. Initially, they didn't have those available. So they'd just so they, dump you off and, They okay, would see you later. bring you here, and yeah. they would find you a job, depending on how the economy was, and then you were signed off as a, as a successful relocatee. I come to the picture. How did they yeah. pick the cities? Is it because of jobs um, availability? Yeah, at there? that particular time in the 60s, these various cities, industrial you know, centers were, were 
progressive or they were doing well. They were prospering, mm -hmm. so they picked those various cities. They had cities all over the United States. Chicago, the initial ones that started were Los Angeles, Chicago, and Denver. Mm -hmm. And it originally started back in, in the latter part, and it was focused only on Navajo people because there was a big, big uh, one winter, a real severe winter in 47 and 48, and a big blizzard that caused a lot of hardship for the Navajos. So they started taking them to Denver on, this real, on their initial program before it was even uh, formalized. Mm -hmm. And then eventually after that became successful, then they started applying it to the larger body of Indians, and that's how they opened up. But they opened up cities, I mean, relocation spots initially in Los Angeles, Denver, Chicago, and other places, and that's where they started. And then they kept moving them out. They ended up having them in Cleveland, Ohio, Detroit, and in the West Coast, they had them in, uh, let's see, Dallas, Texas, out here, and then they had, I think they had a Seattle, I'm not sure if they had a Seattle, but they had several all through the country. And they moved quite a bit of Indians, you know, at that particular time. And what happens in any kind of migration is, is you get one family would go, and then cousins and uncles and brothers and people would follow. So it, it, it spawned also that, that mm -hmm. type of thing going on. And I came in 1960 to San Jose, California. And San Jose in 1960 still had a little element of ruralness to it. Mm -hmm. There were still canneries in the, in the city, mm -hmm. and there were still, you know, farms to be farmed on. And this is because in the Bureau, what they did was they brought to San Jose, they preferred families with children. So that's how come we got a large basis of, mm -hmm. of people here. Mm -hmm. Rather than if you were an individual or a single, they would send you to San, uh, San Francisco or Oakland. Because mm. this had a rural, and they figured that was pretty much like where the Indians came from, more rural. So yeah. this was more of an ideal mm -hmm. spot. But I came here not knowing what San Jose was or not have no background. I, I just picked it. I knew there were some Indians here because I'd gone, one of, the, one of the guys I went to school with, the Indian school with, he was here. So I knew he was out here somewhere. Yeah. Um, and it's interesting because Pat and I went to the same, one of the same Indian schools. <laughs> we went and we both became brick masons or, or bricklayers. We went mm -hmm. to the same trading school, years apart, of course. Mm -hmm. But uh, we eventually went through that same kind of process going. And uh, they've been now in the community for many years, hardworking, good, good community people for us. And uh, they've been taking part in all the events. And Pat's been in a lot of the sports, and Renita's been in a lot of the other other activities. Right. Oh yeah, definitely. Right. Yeah, been. she's at all the meetings. <laughs> tell, right. them, tell them what our, our instructor's name was. <laughs> yeah, you know, we had a we had a bricklayer instructor in at, at the institute Haskell Institute. They called mm -hmm. it then. His name was George Washington. <laughs> <laughs> so I was taught by George Washington. You were, huh? Yeah. So was I. <laughs> now he was, he was a Cherokee Indian, full Eastern Cherokee. Cherokee from Carolina. That's funny. A full-blood Eastern Cherokee, but he had the name George Washington. And he was, a, he was a wonderful man, a wonderful man. He sort of, had to lay those bricks right yeah, out. Yeah, yeah. I wonder who he was named yeah. after. Yeah. <laughs> you know exactly who he was named after. <laughs> Interesting thing, at, at our, on my reservation up in North Dakota, I had his cousin as a principal in high school, Richard Washington. Wow. So, you know, it's a small world, Indian world. You wow. keep bumping in different people, but old George was my instructor, and, and he and I got along real good. You know, it was a good, good friendship. Now, how do you anticipate finding these people for this reunion? Do you, I mean, just from memory, or? Well, we're going to do a variety of things. We're newsletters, we're going to do word of mouth, we're going to try to get some, if I can, get some something in the papers, he's all the, all the newspapers mm -hmm. that we can get space mm -hmm. in and he's through you show. guys yeah. and right. through everybody else to try to get people aware that, we're, that this is up and coming. There's a man in Oakland by the name of Marty Wakazoo, who's another yeah. um, pretty I'm, prominent Indian I man. He runs, the, he runs the Indian yeah. clinics up there in Oakland and San Francisco. He's kind of a brother in, I talk in um, quite San Francisco too? Yeah. 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 He's got a sister that runs the program there yeah. in San Francisco. But I would hope to have him do that section up there, Oakland, San Francisco, and then I'll do one in the South Bay or in San Jose, and eventually we'll come back together and have a grand kind of Bay Area one. Oh, that's yeah, kind of the, nice, that's the plan. Yeah. But I think it's got it's got potential for a good documentary. I Absolutely. think you know because um, you were talking earlier about what caused people to come on relocation. Well, the basic reason was mainly economics. 
to come mm -hmm. to get a job to find them. It was pretty difficult on Indian reservations starting in the 50s, you know, the, the, the social and economic situations in Indian was pretty dire you know, at that particular time. So this was one of the things that pushed moving Indians off the reservation. So they jumped at the chance to go out to get work, just oh, like yeah, anyone else did, yeah. you know. And so that's what brought, it, brought a large amount of the Indians to San Jose or to the various cities that they're in now. So we have large Indian populations in all these major cities now. And uh, they'll pretty much be there. This is, this is the mixing. And that's where in San Jose now we have a large mixture between the, these Indians, the American Indians that came on relocation, plus the, the Native Indians here, mm -hmm. the ones that were originally here. And right. I think that's a good, good mix now. It sure is. There's been intermarriage. There's been different relationships that we've built over the years through that. Yeah. Well, you know, and we're almost out of time. Um, I know we need to have at least a two-part, maybe even three-part series. Let us. What what what, what are you going to have on the next ser uh, part? I know on there's the a lot of issues part, we need to cover. What I'd like to talk to is I'd like to bring the next generation, a couple of people from the, the mm -hmm. like their child or their kids or or the kids that are right below us, and have mm -hmm. them explain their situation, how they see them themselves, particularly as an urban Indian growing up in a city, and then secondly, being their parents talk about the relocation program, and I'm sure they've heard a lot about it from in different contexts, but how they, how they see it themselves. I'd be interested in just hearing them, how they yeah. see that themselves, and how they explain that and yeah. interpret that. That would be really good, yeah. So that that's kind really of what I'd like to do with the second, second go around. Well, we're looking um, forward to that too, because a lot of lot of fascinating, interesting yeah. information. Mm -hmm. And definitely, if anyone who's been on a relocation program or a relocation, contact us. Contact yeah, we'll get you in contact with yeah. Al. So yeah, we'll see you next time. Thank you, and stay tuned. We have more to bring to you. So. Next next week, uh, relocation program. Good night.